So thanks for having me here today. It's nice to be here in person. I joined a few of these online, but I'm here visiting my parents in Fruitvale, actually. So again, I think off in person. So thanks for having me. Uh, Jessica Martin Thompson and I work with the Community Energy Association, and we've been supporting the City of Boston with this retrofit assist program. So I'll just I'll mention who CEA is, just so you understand kind of why we're involved, and then talk a bit about the program itself. And then we're going to have Scott kind of talk. So Scott is the energy advisor that we've been using for the program. So he's done, I think, 39 now, Scott. Um, so he's going to kind of go through some of the common findings he's been seeing in homes within Rockford and then talk about some of the solutions. And then we'll, uh, well, we'll be some time at the end for questions if there's anything that comes up. Can you guys hear me okay online? Okay, angle. <laughs> Um, so uh, Community Energy Association, again, that's who I work for. I'm a climate initiative specialist with them. We're actually a nonprofit that works with local governments across the province on climate activities. So, you know, I, I'm blessed I get to work uh, within the Kootenays, which is where I live now as well, uh, where I live again, I should say. Um, so I work within the Kootenays. I have co workers in Vancouver, Kelowna, all across BC. So really exciting. And we work on all aspects of climate action from working with the local governments, you know, coaching through to kind of with uh, community energy plans. And then on the ground projects like the retrofit assist program that we're supporting Lawson with. Um, I always like to kind of start this one, um, the decade of climate action. We're kind of in it. Uh, you know, every level of government, the federal, provincial, municipal government, have commitments to substantially reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. You know, net zero by 2050, and then there's some pretty hefty uh, interim targets. Most of them are 40 percent reductions um, by 20. 30, which is only seven years away now. <laughs> There's all of these commitments, uh, but unfortunately, you know, and again, I showed this one before, this is not to shame Rosin in any way. We actually worked with uh, UBC, that are scholars program, and they assessed kind of communities across the province. Even communities like Rosin that have incredible programs and have been doing lots of work for years, we're still struggling to kind of see that downward trajectory that will help us to meet those goals. So with that, so Roslyn has signed on. I don't know if people are familiar with that 100% uh, West Kootenai, 100% renewable plan. Uh, so there's 11 municipalities in West Kootenai now signed on to that. So that you know, is making a commitment to be 100% renewable by 2050. So that's, you know, it's 2050 seems like a long way away, but it, it's not like 25 years away. -ish. And then with the new official community plan, Roslyn has, you know, recommitted or reaffirmed their commitment to reducing uh, also fuel use within the community. The big one is they're kind of supporting um, promoting programs to help homeowners. You know, a lot of communities aren't actually doing this. You know, they're making kind of policies and stuff, but don't have on the ground programs. So, you know, Rosalind is uh, unique from that lens as well. So, uh, I'm going to talk about the program. And so, we're calling it a pilot, like a assist pilot. Uh, so, it's kind of a two year pilot, but the goal isn't to kind of do a program here and just leave. The goal is to test a program, figure out what works for homeowners, what works with contractors involved, and then have a program that the, the city can carry on for 10, 20, or many years they want so that we can just keep supporting homeowners to kind of reduce their own use in their homes. There's high level, just <clears throat> pardon me, and it's allergies. I always, it's hard to have a little, like a little tickle these days. It's allergies. <laughs> my cat is shedding way too much. <laughs> just let me premise it with that. <laughs> Um, and this program is supported by the Columbia Basin Trust and Florida BC. So, you know, allowing us to kind of provide a lot more support for homeowners than just what is available through the rebate programs themselves. Why, why a program like this? Uh, so really high level, big, of course, is reducing GHG emissions. Um, people often talk about kind of cool benefits, being, you know, the environmental benefits, the comfort in your home. I've been starting to frame the GHG emission reductions as actually the full benefit because, yeah. Also, greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gas emissions, yeah. Um, just after last few summers, forest fire smoke, the heat domes, like it's, it's for me, it's becoming more important actually to focus on home comfort and people being able to be in their homes you know, throughout the year. Heating, the heating load, of course, in Canada used to be the phenomenon low, but we're going to start seeing kind of a lot more need for the community and keeping houses cool in the summer as well. And then the other uh, third, or uh, one, one, two, three, apologies for that. Um, the, the last one there is actually to kind of support the, the trades 
industry as well to kind of keep up because you know there's a step forward for the new builds the province has you know put regulations in place that's been happening for a number of years now and now it's to kind of time to support the retrofits most of the homes we have or we have by 2030 we have built now so we need to start making sure that we have tools to support those needs that are already built in our communities So retrofit assist. So that's the program that we're supporting the city of Rosa with. Hopefully you guys are in the community and you've seen some of the materials. We've really tried to kind of get materials out there in multiple ways. You know, we've done newspaper and just different ways. Social media, which not everybody's on, newspaper, emails, um, newsletters, all of that stuff. So if you haven't seen it, um, please go on to the Roslyn website as well or retrofitassist.ca slash Roslyn. So this actually, um, this program started with Whistler and Squamish. We were supporting uh, Whistler and Squamish with a similar program, and they were only focused on heat pumps. So it was really exciting for us to kind of take what we've learned with the heat pump side of things and just build that out because we're all sudden wanted to be everything. So now what's really exciting is Whistler's like, hey, wait, we want to do all of that as well. So they're going to take a lot of learnings from this project to build out what they're doing as well. So retrofit assist is really, we try to kind of have a name that, you know, not any fancy with wording and techno word, but it, it's assisting people with their retrofit projects kind of from start to finish um, with their journey. It's, it's complex for a lot of people. There's a lot of rebate programs out there that are hard for people to navigate and it's just helping people make the best decisions for their homes based on what their needs are. You can see here, um, we focus mostly on building on the mechanical systems. You know, down the road, we have, we do it with Envision including renewables on there as well. But you know, I don't know if you guys have seen Energy Pyramid. It's like you should really reduce your load as much as you can first before you start uh, throwing solar panels on your roofs, making sure we can do that side. Here's what kind of the, the process looks like for participants and, and no commitment, um, as you mentioned earlier. So if there's anybody on the call, there was a question earlier about you know, if you sign up for retrofit assist, are you are you committing to something specific and no you're, you're you're signing up you're expressing interest in the program and then the first thing that we actually do is give you a phone call and we have kind of a questionnaire that we walk through with the homeowners to make sure that we can help understand their priorities what they're hoping to get out of the program the budgets that they have available and the questions that they have early on in that process and the next uh step is that we connect to the staff who will be talking earlier or later <laughs> we've met earlier um, and so he's been coming out and doing energy assessments for the homes in Rosalind. Um, we got a dedicated energy advisor for this program, just realizing that there is a shortage in the, in the communities around here to actually get somebody in a home option to your home to do that. And then where we're at, you can see the star kind of in between. There's some people in the first intake that are getting energy evaluations done, and there's some that we're actually working in retrofit plans uh, with them. So basically taking what we've learned with Scott, we've got some tools on the back end to kind of understand the rebates, and the costing and so giving people kind of a one pager in terms of here's what your energy evaluation report says and you kind know, of what the cost of some of those um, scenarios look like for you. As mentioned earlier, we, we do have program experts that we have in-house or not in-house uh, as part of the program as well. So we have a mechanical specialist that will be helping us with the heat pump questions and anything people have there and the building on the boat um, specialist as well. So if you have really technical questions, then we're allowing um we're connecting the contractors with those specialists as well because again. You know, it is a newer industry talking kind of house as a system and newer materials. So making sure that the contractors that are involved have access to um, the, the latest and greatest information as well. So after that, um, get the work done. <laughs> so we do have uh, retrofit assist contractors. So they, they've signed up. So they've signed kind of terms and conditions. And again, so contractors involved, we're not asking them to go above and beyond with their work, but there's certain, you know, we want to make sure that they understand kind of the equipment stuff that specifications for rebate programs that they're putting certain things on the quotes and the most important part for us is that they are actually okay with us doing some quality assurance work so we by no means want to have a program that a bunch of people at the end aren't happy with the quality of the work done so kind of signing off is allowing us to reach out to those experts to say hey you want me to come and have a look and for us it's all learning like we're not here to shame anybody in the work just so everybody can kind of learn together so that's a big part of why we want to sign the terms and conditions and then enjoy there you go and that at the end point uh, that's all along this process the retrofit assist team is kind of there to help if you've got questions you know we're helping people on the front end sign up for the greener homes programs we're helping people will help people on the back end uh, register for the rebate programs and make sure they're maximizing the rebates that are available to them 
Are there any questions? I'm going really fast here. There's lots of content in this conference to get through to. Anything here? Um, so, um, actually, I didn't, I didn't mention this. So we're basically, we're doing two intakes. So we launched the program December 1st. Um, we wanted 50 applicants. Uh, we're at 98, which is wonderful. And then we'll be doing, the original plan is to do a second intake in June. We'll likely be doing that early in May, just so that we can get those folks started with the process as well. We, we likely don't need to promote again. We've got enough people on the wait list. I have a few of you here. Um, so as soon as we're going to get stopped through the first intake, all of the energy evaluation is done, the report's done, and intake in the second one. So we've got Scott booked for I think, two weeks, a week at the end of April, and two weeks in May to be back doing the energy evaluations. Um, yeah, onboarded, as we mentioned, so we have that first phone call. Um, there's the folks that have done the energy evaluation, and you don't have to have an energy evaluation. We are, we are strongly encouraging people to do that. Um, you know, um, Scott can maybe speak to this too. It's just like there's people that have in their mind what they thought they wanted done, and then Scott would come and do the assessment. And they're like, oh, maybe I should be focusing here instead. And, you know, when we were here for the rekindle event, we had a few people come up to say, hey, you know, we got heat pumps, and now we're going to do the, you know, the insulation. It's like, well, there's such a the envelope first, so then you need a small team. So we're wanting to make sure that people are doing things in the right way. And with an energy evaluation, you're getting an unbiased opinion on what's the best way to reduce the energy in your home. It's not based on a contract or a trade, it's what's going to be best for your home, and you need to make decisions from there. And between the Greener Homes grant and uh, the Rosalind's uh, top up, basically, you're paying $50 for the pre and post. So it's $1,050, but between the two programs, so we're getting most of that back. And then we are supporting uh, folks that uh, there's two income qualified programs. So there's the Fortis BC has one, and then the province also has one. And there's different requirements for that. And so we are supporting people that are within those income brackets because there are very substantial rebates through those two programs as well. So just making sure we don't leave anybody behind. Uh, some top learnings, and I, I, these didn't really surprise us. Um, so this is all kind of from the onboarding stuff, what we've learned with this first intake as to kind of why people are wanting to participate. Now, you know, a big part is the financial, like there are lots of rebates, again, three levels of rebates out there that people can access, and also reducing energy bills. <laughs> I just got my hydro bill. Um, I, these guys know, I, I live in a garage with some outbuildings right now as we build them. I'm heating with inefficient electric heat. My electric bill, oh. So yeah, we really want to help people have efficient homes so they're not getting bills like I just got. <laughs> um, reducing their environmental impact is, you know, I don't think my, I hope nobody in this room would argue that climate change is happening, um, but you know, there's people that are really wanting to see that they can in that lens. And then as I mentioned, the net comfort piece, I always tell people, you know, we moved back to summers ago to, you know, a heat dome, we were evacuated from our home three weeks later with forest fires. Nearly killed my dad and three bells to have that like this. You know, we need to really make sure we're ready to have things that we can do that we need to do. Types of support, a big one is the rebates. It's, I, I'm living in this world right now and it still confuses me sometimes. Um, there's, you know, three levels and unfortunately, I'm, there are talks. I am going to talk with you and we're meeting the other day. There's representatives there that they're trying to work to align the federal and provincial program at least, which I think would be really helpful for. People participating, but right now there's three different rebate programs, you know, municipal, federal, and provincial, and three different requirements. So we're just really wanting to focus on the rebate part. Accessing contractors, uh, I don't know who's been trying to get work done lately, but um, they're, they're few and far between in terms of uh, folks that aren't busy, right? So who's willing to take on new work? And it's been really nice to have connect with some of the contractors that are really wanting to support this program, recognizing the importance of helping people to get comfortable in their homes. Another thing, the financial barrier one that's one that still persists. So um, on that lens, we're we're really trying to support homeowners to understand the costs before they get a contractor there and get a quote. They're like, whoa, I didn't realize. So just really trying to prepare homeowners for kind of what's coming down the pipe and better prepare them for when contractors are on site so that they understand what the new wants and the costing are. So we've got some great costing models and rebate models so that we can better inform the homeowners. I mean, it's, it's not cheap undertaking. So it's really trying to help you make the best choice with the dollar by your person. I think I've kind of gone through all this already. I mentioned, you know, we're finishing kind of that first take, helping 
first intake, helping those folks to come up with the plan, understand kind of the dollars associated with that, and you'll get them connected to the contractors and starting the work. And then at the same time, we'll be onboarding that second intake to start the process with that second intake. And there's, I think everybody here is registered or I know these guys are. And do, you, do you work for Sever? Uh, well, it's for me, it's oh, okay. No, I don't. I recognize the logo again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, Scott, are you good to jump in? So what our plan was now is we're going to kind of go through these four buckets of things that are kind of the common stuff that you're seeing in the evaluations. Talk about some ideas of what you could do. He's got some great pictures on stuff that he's seeing within the community. And then if you've got any further questions, we're happy to address those as well. Can you hear me okay? Wait, is there any questions online? I can see here. Sorry, no. Right, yeah, we can we can hear you live. Okay, there, Scott. Okay. Oh, very happy. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Um, common findings. I mean, this is pretty much a list of everything you would find in a house. Um, so definitely, with the uh, variety of housing types in Rossland, um, you're going to find a, a variety of uh, areas that you can upgrade. Um, but definitely air sealing has been, uh, well, in the energy efficiency world, air sealing is one of the um, biggest ways that you can um, reduce your energy usage well not so much usage but your energy loss through your building envelope um so that's number one typically and then you look at your building envelope so starting with you know attic insulation or definitely a lot of crawl space and foundation walls uh are going are uninsulated and that would include the joy spacing and header areas down there as well um, there are some houses with some older windows and doors. Um, and then lastly, once you have a good handle on your building envelope, you can look at upgrading some of those older mechanical systems. Um, so we can move to the next slide. Um, so one of the safety concerns to look at before um, doing any insulation or air sealing work, um, one would be asbestos. Um, this can come in the form of vermiculite insulation. Uh, maybe you have old insulation wrapped around pipes um, or some adhesives as well. Um, so basically, if there's anything in your house that looks like it could be one of these items, um, then it's, for one, it's it's not a good idea to do um, the blower door test just because um, by moving the air through the building envelope, it's going to disturb a lot of these um, insulations that have just been sitting dormant in the house. And once they're kind of disturbed, those particulates get in the air and that's when they can uh, start to cause a lot of harm in the house. Um, through uh, air leakage in the house, you get a lot of moist air, warm, moist air leaking out of the house. Um, and you can't see it going through, you know, little holes in your air barrier in your wall or up through your attic. And this water um, moisture condensation will sit on your, um, you know, inside of your drywall or inside of your plywood and, and slowly just start to create fungal growth, um, which turns into mold, um, which can be very hazardous to your health. Um, some other things to look at in older houses is the type of paint that they uh, have used. So there could be lead paint with some off-gassing going on. So it would be a good idea to remove that while you're doing um, some of these retrofit upgrades. Um, and then definitely looking at gas safety. So if you're smelling gas, um, you can contact Fortis and they'll be able to, um, uh, you know, send someone out to make sure there's not a gas leak. Um, one of the things you might find with uh, a house that might have good air sealing is combustion spillage. So if you have a very tight building envelope, but you don't have um, 
proper mechanical ventilation. Uh, when you turn on a lot of your ventilation systems, say your dryer or your range hood and your uh, bath fans all at the same time, it could create enough negative pressure that in some of these older um, hot water heaters that have the atmospheric tank, so basically just have a flue on the top that's open that uh, relies on the heat from the, the tank to push the gas up. But if there's enough draw from some of these um, higher ventilation systems, especially if you went and put in some um, high CFM range hood fan, there could be a chance that it would be, uh, it could draw that gas back down into your house. Um, so when you're doing your air sealing, you, uh, you also want to make sure that you're you're going to understand that the tighter you make your house, that you're going to want to either remediate that with um, uh, mechanical ventilation or have some uh, makeup air into your home as well to compensate for that. Then go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, as we're doing these um, energy evaluations, we tend to look at the house as a whole, as a system, um, how everything performs together um so it's not necessarily you know just picking certain things you have to take the whole plan into account which is what your energy advisor will help you with as well and you'll see in your renovation upgrade reports um for example you know as we just spoke about if you seal up your house um but you don't really look at your mechanical ventilation um, you're going to get some poor air quality in your house because this uh, air that your furnace or your air conditioner is bringing into the home isn't being properly ventilated out. And uh, you have people in there and plants and cooking and showering and that moisture has nowhere to go. So it goes into your building envelope and again can turn into mold there. Um, if you're retrofitting your walls and you don't quite understand vapor and air barrier systems, um, putting your vapor barrier in the wrong part of your wall could trap moisture in there or having two. Um, so it's a good idea to understand or at least talk to your energy advisor and contractor about that. Um, and then of course, looking at upgrading your mechanical systems. Another example, if you do any of that work before you, um, do any envelope work once you actually you know increase the insulation or decrease your air leakage in your home these systems that you put in before you did that will tend to be oversized and they won't heat the home properly they'll continue to cycle and uh, it'll just be wasting more energy and ultimately more money for you as well um so here's a little graphic um just kind of depicting what air sealing looks like. So when we talk about air sealing, one of the terms we use is air changes per hour. It essentially just means how many, how many times in one hour the entire volume of air in your house uh, comes in the building and leaves the building through pressure difference and uh, leakage points in your house. So um, an eight to 10 air leakage per hour or higher, um, which, is probably about the average, I would say, about air changes that we've seen with the houses that we've done in Rossland. Um, that's a very leaky house, so you're losing a lot of heat um, and a lot of moisture is going into your bed building envelope as well. Um, so typically with existing homes, you would look to improve that by a few air changes per hour and get it down to about four or seven. Um, if you can get it less than four, I mean, that's excellent air sealing, but that's when you want to start looking at including some mechanical ventilation or makeup air just to ensure the, the air quality in your home remains um, suitable for you and your family. Um, so this graphic here basically uh, depicts um, areas in your attic that you would want to look at air sealing. So a lot of the places, basically any place you would see a penetration in your ceiling, um, there could be a good chance that you are going to have air leakage there. Um, so this could come in the forms of say a bath fan going out um, the ceiling, pot lights in your ceiling, um, 
you know, your attic hatch is actually typically one of the leakiest areas in the house because there's no weather stripping on the trim. <clears throat> so there's a lot of leakage through there. Uh, one of the other big leakage points, um, which we'll show in a graphic later, is chimneys that go from, you know, the basement all the way up to the attic. Um, even the ones that have been enclosed in drywall, um, that's still not sealed up at the top. Uh, where it protrudes out your ceiling uh, so you get a lot of air leakage through there as well um, so we can go to the next graphic um, so other places to look at um, you know your exposed floors or cantilevers as they call them um, usually you can't really see underneath them as you see in that top graphic you can so um, the where you would feel that is in your house on your floor you might feel a draft coming from under the floor uh, under the, the baseboard trim um, if there's a cantilever or a, a or exposed floor on the other side of that wall there's a good chance that there's no air barrier or insulation under there um, anywhere in your wall system that you have penetrations coming out so electrical mechanical uh, your water coming in and out those are very typical places that we find a lot of air leakage um, in the attic area, those little knee walls in the one and a half story houses, um, there's quite a bit of air leakage that comes through the little door that you go in there, as well as the actual wall. There doesn't tend to be a continuous air barrier on there. Um, when you're looking at foundations, the floor joists and uh, the penetrations that go through there. So whichever contractor did the work, they didn't seal that up going out of the wall. Um, and then basically just other miscellaneous penetrations around your exterior wall. So a lot of outlets and switches um, tend to have a lot of air leakage as well. Around your windows, there's an area called a rough opening um, that if it's not sealed up properly when that window was installed, you won't even be able to see it. It'll be behind your trim, um, but that, that will be a source of air leakage. Um, and in a lot of these vaulted ceilings where you see um, big timber frames or um, wherever these big timber frames are, we found in these houses, there are there is a ton of air leakage around those. Um, when those were installed or when those houses were built, obviously air sealing wasn't a main concern. So there's not a lot of sealing around there. Um, and definitely in these vaulted ceilings, um depending on what kind of air barrier they have in behind there you're going to see some air leakage in, in and around skylights and track lighting and uh one of the places i we have found is a lot of you know the airtight wood stoves where the uh the flue exits the building as well there tends to be a lot of air leakage around there the next slide so here's some examples that we found in uh, some of the houses here. So first one, you see a big timber frame that's going through the wall, right where it's going through that wall when the, you can feel the air coming in. Um, a lot of basements where there's not finished insulation, but also those older wood windows um, tend to be quite leaky as well. Um, another photo where you've got the big timber frame and even though you have that air barrier in between, it's where that timber frame exits the building envelope. You see a lot of leakage. Uh, the bottom left photo is basically an air barrier that's been cut through because someone was running wires through there and they didn't take the time to seal that back up. So there's a lot of uh, kind of careless mistakes or just not really knowing what they're, that, you know, that air barrier is important. So um, a lot of places like that that can be sealed up. And of course, the, the chimneys, as we talked about, that exit through the building envelope, you can just see that big hole around the chimney that's basically air directly to uh, coming in and out of your, your home. Um, so just an overview of insulation. Um, so basically thermal insulation equals material that resists, resists heat flow and therefore insulates the building. Um, so insulation is used to reduce uh, heat transfer. Um, you're never going to stop it completely, um, but the 
basically the rule of thumb is the thicker insulation you have, um, the less heat transfer you're going to have through that assembly. Of course, you know, if you have um, other thermal conductors like wood in your wall, which most houses do, um, those places tend to be um, where the heat will transfer through rather than directly through the insulation. Um, so in newer construction these days, um, in BC, we've moved to a step code. So we're at a step three right now, um, which typically will look like R50 insulation in your attic and your above grade walls will be close to R24 um, nominal insulation. <laughs> so in Rossland, we're finding a lot of attics with, um, you know, less than R30 insulation and definitely a lot of the walls, um, not quite R24 as you can't really get that much insulation in a two by four wall either, so. Um, some of the materials you can use for insulating <clears throat> and the way they come, you can use uh, bat insulation, which is typically in walls and cathedral ceilings and you might see stuffed in between joists and that that tends to be made out of fiberglass or mineral wool which is something you might see on the exterior of a building the loose fill insulation um, typically you uh, will see that in your attic space which could come in the form of fiberglass or mineral wool or cellulose um, and basically the difference between these insulations are what they're made out of um, and that will essentially affect their R value per inch. So some insulations will have a higher R value per inch, which means that in tighter spaces, they might be a better fit um, because you can get more R value in there. Um, however, those tend to be a little bit more costly as well. Um, you can look at some rigid board, which uh, comes in the form of mineral wool or extruded uh, polystyrene insulation. Um, or polyiso insulation so that styrofoam I guess insulation that you see you can see on the exterior of homes or sometimes on the interior of your foundation walls is where you might see those um, spray foam is another uh, form of insulation <clears throat> um, this definitely requires a certified installer and uh, it is good for very tight spaces um, it is can be good for um, labor wise for doing in joist spaces um, where your floor joists run across, but um, it again can that be one of the more higher costing ways to do it. But uh, in the long run, depending on the application that you're doing, it might make the most sense. So that's why it's a good conversation to have with your energy advisor and your contractor and um, just get a good understanding of, you know, when you're measuring what, uh, what you're trying to accomplish with, you know, how much insulation you want to put in to achieve energy efficiency goals. But at the same time, you weigh that against what your budget is and what you're, you know, able to spend on each particular upgrade. Hey, Scott, just to end seeing the time. I'm thinking maybe I'll just jump to the slides that have the Roslyn examples and you can talk. Yeah, okay. I could talk for hours about this stuff. <laughs> no, all good. Well, and, and they did do sessions on each of these. So we'll, we'll share the slides so everybody has this information, but I just want to get to Yeah, it. let's do that. Sure. So, yeah, I guess um, regarding what we've seen um, in these first houses that we've done in Rossland, um, I would say about 80% of the houses uh, don't have insulation in crawl spaces um, or uh, finished or basements as well, um, which usually is that you can see in the first um, picture there that that's the joist spacing, what they would call the header area. So that's what your floor is sitting on. Um, and in new construction, all these walls will be insulated and there'll be an, a proper air and vapor barrier on there as well. Um, so depending on how deep your basement is, um, you know, your frost line in Rossland, you're looking at about two and a half to three feet. So that wall is sitting, you know, above grade or above that frost line. So basically you've got freezing ground or outside 
um, air right outside that wall. So you um, insulating those walls would be a, a great first step and actually a pretty pretty simple one as well as they're easily accessed. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, and if you don't uh, want to do your crawl space walls, you do have the option of doing the floor above the crawl space. Um, this will essentially just turn your crawl space into an untreated area. So basically not a heated space, um, which could be an easier option as well. There's less, um, you know, space for your furnace or your heating system to heat. Um, the only thing you just want to pay attention to is if you have any water lines um, or even heating ducts running under there, you want to make sure that they're insulated because it'll be a, a cold space under there. Um, and then in the attic, so these are examples, uh, the first two of the knee wall attic areas. So basically, as you can see, those are two by four pieces of wood and the insulation barely comes up to the top of those. So you're going to get a lot of heat loss through even where the insulation is, but uh, especially that wood. So the best ways to do that is just get some either get some blown in insulation right on top of that. Um, if there's no vermiculite or anything, which we haven't seen a lot of, then you can um, yeah, blow the insulation right on top of it or lay some bats on there as well. Um, and that will stop uh, the heat loss going through um, the insulation. So attic is, is what we would call low hanging fruit in terms of heat loss, because your heat's always rising in your house um, and going out your, your ceiling area. So we can go on to the next slide. Um, so yeah, here's looking at using some rigid foam. So a lot of ceilings um, in Rossland too, we have vaulted ceilings um, or cathedral-like ceilings where there isn't access to see what's inside there. Um, so basically a lot of these ceilings, you're going to see ice damming, um, even in some other attic spaces as well. This is where there's so much heat loss through the attic that, and the ceiling space that it's melting the snow on top. Um, and the water will drip down, but it's freezing before it can drip off the ceiling. And that just creates all of a sudden this ice buildup. And depending on what roof system you have, so if you have shingles, um, this ice is just going to basically go up under those shingles and eventually get into your wood and rot your wood as well. So one way to do this is if you're going to replace your shingles, um, is to build up the insulation on the exterior. So this way you don't have to do any major renovations or rip any drywall out. If you want to add insulation, you can just add rigid insulation and then some strapping for an airspace and, and it'll really help. Um, if you're ever going to do your siding of your walls, it might be a great idea to look at um, adding exterior insulation just because um, you can really combat your, your, your thermal barrier as well as your air barrier there because you can just wrap your house in Tyvek, put on the um, exterior insulation and then put your your siding back on and um, that essentially means that your air barrier is now on your exterior and you don't have to worry about doing all those little air sealing um, points in your house um, which can be pretty hard and a little cumbersome to uh, to get all of them um, same with your below grade walls and crawl spaces you can put rigid insulation on the uh, exterior or the interior as well it's a lot easier than you know, framing out a wall in a crawl space or something um, going that route. Yeah, for sure. So here's just some pictures of uh, kind of typical foundation walls, nice and painted, but there's no insulation on there. So um, you're going to get a lot of heat loss through there as well. So basically with a wall like that, you could frame it out two by four or two by six. You could put some of that rigid insulation on it as well, depending on if you want it to be a finished look or not. Um, the other option would be to do spray foam. You could frame it and use spray foam as well, which would be your air barrier and your vapor barrier, as well as providing our value. Uh, there are, sorry. Uh, sorry, just see this. We'll actually send out links to these resources. BC Housing has some great stuff for anybody that wants to do it themselves. Or there's also some consumer guides in terms of what you should be asking from contractors and stuff as well. Um, maybe we'll just do one on the windows and then I know there's somebody here that wanted to. Yeah, 
Yeah, for sure. So um, I definitely find a lot when I go into a home, the first thing the homeowners think that they want to do or should do is their windows. Uh, most people, I think, um, think that windows are the, the most or the biggest thing you can do to help the energy efficiency of your home, which is not, um, not entirely untrue, um, but definitely shoring up your insulation in your attic, your walls, your header area, your crawl space, doing all that first um, will have a greater impact than just switching out your windows. But once you do all that, um, you know, it is a good idea to look at some of your windows. Um, definitely a lot of older ones um, that have, you know, wood frame and single pane. Um, those would be some windows to look at replacing first and foremost. Um, but, you know, windows do have one of the uh, biggest um, heat loss as well. Um, but it's a very good idea to look at uh, doing the rest of your your upgrades to your building envelope before you do your windows and then move on to your mechanical systems. Maybe if we can maybe spend five minutes on mechanical stuff, then we'll just save some time for questions at the end. Yeah, absolutely. So just quickly with mechanicals, um, there definitely are a few older furnaces um, and a few older hot water tanks. Even some of the newer hot water tanks that have been replaced are, are some of the more inefficient ones. As you can see in the, the third photo, they have that natural or sorry, that atmospheric venting. So basically just the flue on the top. Um, those are kind of the most inefficient water heaters you can have. Um, so basically, you know, you could look at replacing your, once you've done all your building envelope, you can get your heating, your mechanicals sized the right way. Um, if you're looking at, you know, you want to stick with natural gas for your hot water heater, then you could look at putting in a tankless hot water heater. They're very highly efficient. Or if you go electric, you can put in, you know, an electric heat pump. Um, when replacing your heating system, you can definitely go with, a, you know, a, a high efficient natural gas furnace. Um, however, um, it's definitely a good idea, especially with rising heat um, that, you know, tends to be hitting um, our area a lot more frequently in the summer. Um, we call it future proofing with a, with a heat pump. Um, so essentially you could have your, your heat pump, which would run on electricity, which could heat your house as well as cool it and then have your backup natural gas. And they do have cold climate heat pumps, which are very efficient up to like minus 25, minus 30. And um, essentially, yeah, that way, whatever the um, government decides to do with the price of gas or the price of electricity, you have the option to switch between. So you have that dual fuel ducted heat pump where essentially, if you know, gas prices are high, you can heat your home with electricity. Um, if electricity remains a higher commodity, you can use the, the gas furnace to, to heat your, your house as well. Um, and with the heat pump, if you, you can go with a ducted system, or if you want some more zoned heating, um, or if you have, you know, electric baseboard heating, or you don't have, uh, you know, heat vents going up to your, your little loft or your one and a half story, you can put in a ductless mini split and basically you can have, um, complete control over wherever you put them because you just have that outdoor unit with that indoor head on the wall and each indoor head is controlled um, individually so it gives you a lot more control over the heating and cooling and individual levels and rooms of your house hmm. are you good to talk to that one and then maybe we'll yeah so basically mechanical ventilation we mentioned um, and what that would look like is what they call a heat recovery ventilator or an energy recovery ventilator. Um, so essentially these units um, would be put in your house <clears throat> and they're continually cycling the air in your house. Um, and they can basically you know, cycle the air in your house two times before they'll exhaust it out of the house. Um, but what they do is they do capture the heat that is exhausting um, from your house, they'll capture some of that heat to help heat the air that's coming into your house so your furnace doesn't have to work as hard to heat that air. Um, so it's a very high efficient um, ventilation um, component um, and definitely very important to consider 
um, the tighter that you make your house um, and the more um, the more you shore up your air barrier and have less air changes per hour. So, but these are uh, all things that you can discuss with your, your energy advisor and he can help to, or she can help to uh, monitor that and uh, just make sure that you're aware of how your house is performing and uh, we're using all these systems and upgrading your insulation um, you're going to have complete control over your indoor or indoor air quality as well as the the comfort of your house too. Sorry, I know you wanted to was heat pumps that you were specific. Was there specific stuff because we kind of are there specific questions that you have on? Uh, no. Okay, because so, there's a couple other slides there, and then I know they did a presentation. Yeah. <laughs> Um, maybe I'll speak to this one and just want to make sure that you have this. I'm getting people all the time. We started a little late, so you have to skip through a little bit. But as I mentioned, there's there's a lot of rebate programs out there. So part of the retrofit assist role is to kind of support them when you're navigating those different systems. So I do have um, for the retrofit assist, we put together actually a kind of homeowner cheat sheet on these, which I can share with you, Matt, if you want to send it out as well. And it just goes through each of those rebates and, and the levels of rebates that are available. For insulation for heat pumps for the various components so we can send out that list to folks and then just in terms of contractors i think i mentioned like so we do have kind of retrofit assist contractors so if you're going through the program we'll we'll provide that list to you when you get to certain phases so if you want to heat pump them we'll send you to those particular contractors um but if you're choosing to not work with the retrofit assist contractor you know just some things to really be aware of like you know training and certification is a big thing that there, with a lot of this, I also mentioned, like you can actually do damage to your home if you're not cognizant of how you're dealing with your building and stuff. So just make sure when you're chatting with any contractors that they're aware of kind of that house as a system approach and you know have the lingo available. There is the Home Performance Contractors Network. So that is the provincial rebate programs are tying the contractor requirements to that. So basically, it's a network of uh, qualified contractors that meet certain qualifications. So a number of them for retrofit assist are already HPCN qualified or are going through the process of getting all of the training that's required for that. And then just in terms of the heat pump stuff, you know, we talked a lot about kind of the sizing and whatnot. So that, that's a big piece that we're hearing across the industry is just kind of improper sizing. So it's too small or it's too big, it's not right for your home. So it's cycling inefficiency inefficiently or you're not happy with how it's heating your home. So that's a big one, and it, it is in the building cone in terms of how heat pump contractors should be sizing them, but there's nobody kind of up leasing that at the moment. So that's a big one I would recommend that you ask contractors if you're if you're dealing with mechanical systems, how is it, how are they sizing the mechanical system? Because they can't look at your furnace and be like, hey, this is the size of your furnace, we're gonna do that for heat pump. They're completely different systems in terms of how they operate in your home. And then I think um, Scott mentioned kind of the cold climate piece too. So there's heat pumps now that will operate efficient, efficiently up to a minus 25, right? So they're installing them up north, you know, so there's a lot of conversations with heat pumps that have been installed. Oh, they don't work in our funds. Yeah, the ones that were made 20 years ago may not work efficiently, you know, in Rosal, but there's lots of technology that's changing now that makes it makes it so they can operate in this climate or a dual fuel system as with French, so that you have that furnace there to back up if it starts to not operate. Yeah, so we, we don't talk about in this one, geothermal is a fantastic option, but you need the land associated with it, right? It's a very it's most efficient operating. Yeah, so we actually, um, we did a whole session on it um, through a different program, but I'd be happy to send that link in terms of kind of what you look for in terms of the system. They are popular, they're just really expensive and do need the money. I want to Sure, like I think you have to go very deep here. Yeah. Like where I live out, I'm near, I'm near my house, it's actually right out there because we're very lots of thermal activity. 
Yeah, yeah, I think it's very dependent on location and the drill depth can add up quickly. So from an economic perspective, even though it's the most efficient, it's usually, yeah, people don't go for it. Yeah. Great question, thank you. Yeah, that's what we plan to do because we have them. Um, I think we've kind of covered all of this kind of that housing system. And again, you know, they're not, it's not mandatory to have an undergrad evaluation through that triple assist, but we're highly recommending it so that you get an expert like Saw that's giving you kind of an unbiased opinion as to what's best for your house. Yeah, that's it, I guess I wanted to, we're actually at time now, so we did leave a lot of time for questions, but are there questions on, from anybody that's online or anybody here? Anybody online, feel free to you can type a question into the chat or you can unmute yourself and um, impose your question. Um, I'll just say too, while we're waiting for anybody with questions, uh, Scott did a very good job of doing a brief overview of a lot of the different components involved in home energy retrofits. Um, if you go to the Sustainability Commission YouTube page, you can find videos on a lot of those topics that we've done through these talks over the last couple of years. Um, so if some of that went over your head or you have more questions about it, you can check out those videos that sort of drill down into those topics a little bit more. Uh, no questions online, it doesn't seem like. <laughs> no questions here. Um, yeah well was there anything else you wanted to add no i think that's no? it if you're not registered if a couple of you are registered you will go to retrofits.ca slash roslyn get yourself on the wait list because we're likely full with the second intake pretty darn quick um so if you do want to get involved uh in kind of this next six months please do so and then my email's here or feel free to email roslyn at retrofitassist.ca if there's any kind of follow-up questions, I mean, you know, I'll get back to you. Um, I'm going to ask a bit more about the geothermal, so I appreciate that intake. Um, yeah, um, I was <laughs> our mechanical expert. I, I talk to him often about my own circumstances because we're building. So I've talked a lot with him about geothermal, <laughs> but we have the land to do it, right? So it's an interesting one. No, I think that's it. And Any uh, closing thoughts from you there, Scott? uh no thank you very much uh for having me and uh definitely uh i know there's a lot of information in there so if anyone does have questions after the fact um they can get my contact info from jessica and, and have a conversation perfect thanks a lot for taking the time to join us thanks scott yeah absolutely thanks for having me and uh, thank you jessica for walking us through walking us through the program and thank you everybody for joining us um yeah this Tonight's presentation will be posted um, on YouTube sometime in the next couple of days, um, along with our other videos. So if you uh, want to recommend it to a friend, please do so. And that's a wrap. Thank you all very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you.